welcome back. Today we're finally going to be diving into the parts of the brain, where they're located and what their functions are. As you can see, there are a lot of them, but we're gonna go through each one and talk about what their function is, where we can find it in the brain, and in some cases, hopefully give you some mnemonics or some tips that will help you remember what these different parts of the brain do. But before we get there, we should probably start by talking about how do we know where all of these parts of the brain are and what they do. And to look at that, we need to look at the different types of brain scans that we can do to understand both the structure and the function of the brain. So brain scans are really divided into two major categories. We have what's known as functional brain scans that show us what the brain is doing and structural brain scans that show us the different parts of the brain. So let's start by taking a look at our functional brain scans. The first one we have here is called an EEG, and this is used to help us measure brain activity by looking at brain waves. We'll talk about this one a lot in our sleep and consciousness unit because this helps us to know what stage of sleep we're in when someone is hooked up to an EEG while they're sleeping. The other functional brain scan is known as a PET or a PET scan. And this one shows us the different functions of the brain by injecting glucose into our bloodstream. And then we're able to track the brain activity and you can see different areas light up under different functions. So you can see here the darker areas where it's yellow or red are where the brain is being used right now. And so it helps us to know the areas of the brain that are used under different conditions. What I like to do to remember pet scans is to think of the sentence, I feed my pet sugar or I feed my pet glucose because sugar is glucose. That helps me to remember that this is the scan that requires glucose in the bloodstream in order to see the different blood flow to different areas of the brain. The other category of the brain that we have are known as structural brain scans. So these are gonna show us the actual details of the brain and where the different structures are located. So these would be things like a CT or a CAT scan, which is essentially an X-ray for your brain, or you can do an MRI. And of course we can do MRIs on more areas than just the brain. Perhaps you know of someone that's had an MRI on a shoulder or a knee for an injury. This is a great way to also look for changes in the brain to see if any injury has taken place. The most comprehensive type of exam is going to show us both the structures and the functions of the brain, and that is known as an fMRI, or a functional MRI. What's nice about an fMRI is it gives us the details that an MRI does, so we can see all of the different structures, but it will also show us the brain activity, kind of like a PET scan, so we can see the specific areas of the brain that light up under different conditions. It's with this that we can really start to understand where the different parts of the brain exist and what their functions are. So let's go ahead and dive in with the parts of the brain. We're going to start with the oldest part of the brain, evolutionarily speaking, and the first part that forms when our brain is forming, and that is the brainstem. The brainstem contains all of our basic life functions, our heart rate, our breathing, the ability to wake up and fall asleep. All of that is going to be within our brainstem which makes sense since it is the first thing that forms in our brain. We can't live if we don't have our heartbeat and we can't breathe. So the parts that are responsible for our heartbeat and our breathing is known as the medulla. And the medulla is inside of our brainstem. Also in our brainstem is the reticular formation. And that's what essentially wakes us up in the morning. If we didn't have a reticular formation, we would fall into a coma. And then on the very top of the brainstem is what is known as the thalamus. And the thalamus is our relay center, our sensory switchboard, as you were. And the thalamus's job is to take in all of the information from our body and send it to the correct part of our brain. So if we see something, it will take it to the thalamus and then take it to our visual cortex. If we hear something, it will take it to our thalamus and then take it to our auditory cortex. So everything that we see, feel, and hear is going to go through our thalamus first and then go on to the part of the brain that is responsible for that. And as we all know, on the back of our heads is our cerebellum. And as we know from the memory unit, 
the cerebellum is responsible for muscle movement and memory. So remembering how to shoot a basketball or how to play cards is going to be in the cerebellum. It's also responsible for coordination and balance. So without a cerebellum, we might be a little bit wobbly. As we move up in the brain, we move into a center component that is known as the limbic system. So as we advance from our basic life functions, we now see more instinctual behaviors that exist in our limbic system. The limbic system holds three major brain parts, and those are the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. The amygdala is our emotional center of our brain. Especially strong emotions such as aggression, anger, and fear are housed within the amygdala. You can think angry Amy or angry Amy G. Dalla to help us remember that the amygdala is emotions. We all know that hippos have a good memory on campus and that the hippocampus is responsible for memories. And the final piece that's in our limbic system is the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus, I like to think of hypo and thalamus. One of its big functions is hunger and thirst. But the hypothalamus is really responsible for regulating a lot of bodily functions. These are things such as the fight or flight response, the reward centers that are associated with dopamine and hormones. So another way to remember the hypothalamus is to think of the four Fs. And they stand for food, fight or flight, and the last F is fornication. An interesting side note about the hypothalamus and the fight or flight response is that there's actually four components of that survival mechanism. We often think of fight or flight as our response to some type of danger, but people have four different responses that they will typically use when they're faced with a stress or a danger. Some do fight back, some will run away, but others will freeze and others will what we call fawn. So fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. And fawning is when we give into the stress or danger in order to appease whatever the aggressor might be. And as we move up to the top of our brain, this is known as the cerebral cortex. And the cerebral cortex is the last thing to develop. And this is where all of our higher level thinking is, processing, and where the majority of our functions take place in our brain. The cerebral cortex is made up of four lobes, and you can think of them as FPOT, the frontal, parietal, occipital, and temporal, F-P-O-T, or FPOT. Let's start by taking a look at the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe holds three major structures, the prefrontal cortex, the motor cortex, and the Broca's area. So the frontal lobe is responsible for planning, movement, decision-making, and moral reasoning. Our prefrontal cortex, one of the last parts of our brain to develop, is where that planning and decision-making is located. Our motor cortex is responsible for muscle movement. So if you think when you choose to lift a hand, that is your front of your brain deciding that and then moving those muscles. And the Broca's area is responsible for speech. And so choosing to move your mouth to form the words you want to say is also taking place in the front of your brain. So the prefrontal cortex, the motor cortex, and the Broca's area make up our frontal lobe. The motor cortex is in the very back of our frontal lobe, and it sits right next to our sensory cortex. And the sensory cortex is the one thing that we need to know that is in the parietal lobe. So the parietal lobe holds the sensory cortex or the somatosensory cortex. And so you can use the function synonymously. They both are responsible for our sense of touch. So it's a creepy mnemonic, but it really does work. If you think of the sentence, P.S. I want to touch you, the P and S stand for parietal and sensory. And that will remind us that both are responsible for the sense of touch. The interesting thing about the motor cortex and the sensory cortex is there is a specific spot on that strip responsible for each body part. So everything we feel and every muscle we move has a specific area of the brain that is dedicated to controlling that specific part of the body. And the opposite side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body. So when you lift your right hand, the left side of your brain is controlling that movement and vice versa. And each body part has a different amount of space in the brain 
that it is dedicated to. And to show you a visual of how much space in our brain is required for each different part of our body, we have what's known as a homunculus. And so this very creepy looking creature that we see here is a visual representation of how much space is dedicated to each part of our body in our brain. So you can see our hands and our face are much bigger than the other parts of the body because we as humans use our hands and our face the most often. So receiving that touch sensation and also moving those parts of the body are going to require more space from our brain than say our leg or our foot or our torso. On the back of our head, we have our occipital lobe and you can think of occipital like optical. The occipital lobe holds our visual cortex and of course with visual, think vision. This lobe and this cortex is responsible for our sense of sight. So everything you see goes from your thalamus to your occipital lobe and your visual cortex. Last but not least, we have our temporal lobe, which is on both sides of our head. And you can think of temporal lobe like tempo because we hear the tempo of the music. The temporal lobe holds the auditory cortex, think audio, and it's on the side of our heads so you can think the temporal cortex is where hearing is. There's really two parts of the temporal lobe that we need to know, the auditory cortex and the Wernicke's area. And Wernicke's area is responsible for language comprehension. So it's the reason why you can understand the things that you're hearing. So as you're listening to this video, you hear my voice, but the Wernicke's area helps you to understand the words that I'm saying and the words that you're reading on the screen. And so many different brain parts work together. They don't just exist as a single piece. When you see something, for example, that you need to read, that's gonna go from your thalamus to your occipital lobe and visual cortex. If you read it out loud, it's going to go to your Broca's area in your frontal lobe and your Wernicke's area helps you to understand it, as well as additional association areas, such as the fusiform gyrus that helps us recognize faces or the angular gyrus that turns words or numbers into a code that our brain can understand. That's how we read sentences and also solve math problems. So there's so many different amazing parts of the brain and together they help make us who we are, help us think the way that we think and act the way that we do. In our next video, we'll also see how resilient our brain is and how our brain responds when confronted with injuries. So thank you so much for watching and as always, be kind to your mind.